We used to have more continents. Wait, how many are there now? One, two, three, four, five, six, or seven? I guess it depends who you ask, but there used to be more. These aren't just myths or made up continents from some sci-fi or fantasy book. This is real. They are real land masses, vast vibrant stretches of earth that once existed above sea level but disappeared beneath the oceans, taking with them most of their history. Today we're going to go on a little journey to discover these submerged worlds. Particularly two that I find super fascinating, which are Doggerland and Zealandia. Along the way we'll stop by a few more, like Sundaland, Beringia and Mauritia. If after this video you want to visit some of these places, the good news is you don't need a passport, you can just go there. Bad news is you're probably going to need some scuba diving equipment because there's no land for you to step on. Let's start close to home, if you live in Europe, with Doggerland. With one of the silliest names I've ever heard, if you look at a modern map of the North Sea, it seems like Great Britain is quite the isolated island. You get a feeling that they've always existed as a close brother of continental Europe. But for much of the last Ice Age, that wasn't the case. Britain was in fact connected to mainland Europe, it was a part of it, by a large expanse of low-lying land stretching from what is now the east coast of England all the way to the Netherlands, Denmark and beyond. That land was Doggerland. When you look at a map of the Netherlands a few hundred years ago compared to one today, you can see that they've used a bunch of land reclamation techniques to stretch their territory, expand into the water and essentially expand into these low-lying lands that were underwater. So I guess part of Doggerland still exists as part of the Netherlands. At its peak around 20,000 years ago, Doggerland could have been as large as 100,000 square kilometers, about the size of Iceland or half of the UK today. And it wasn't a barren no man's land. This was prime real estate for Mesolithic hunter-gatherer people. There were rivers, forests, lakes, plenty of animals to hunt. If you were a prehistoric human looking to settle down, it was probably a good choice. It is what strikes me the most about this place. People actually lived here. Humans. This isn't a case of some weird landmass that existed before humans became a thing. We were around at the same time as this. Who knows, maybe our common great 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 grandparents roamed around in it together. So what happened to it? Essentially rising sea levels. As the last ice age ended and glaciers melted, sea levels climbed by over 100 meters. Doggerland slowly turned into marshes, similar to much of what we see today in eastern England, then islands, and finally by around 6500 BC, most of it was underwater. A massive tsunami from the Storega slide, it was essentially a giant underwater landslide off the coast of Norway in around 6200 BC, might have delivered the final blow, wiping out the remaining land masses and maybe communities, and turning Doggerland into nothing but a memory. The sea level is still not as deep there, and to be precise the land is still there, it's just underwater. And what if it never had sunk? Britain might never have been an island nation. English, Dutch and Danish cultures maybe could have formed a single continental mesh. Either each country would have expanded its borders there or maybe new ones would exist in between. The Channel Tunnel wouldn't be an uh, engineering marvel, it would just be a regular road. And history might have been incredibly different. Britain maybe wouldn't have survived something like early World War II because they wouldn't benefit from their island isolation. On the other hand, something like Brexit maybe wouldn't have happened because there wouldn't be as much of a feeling of physical separation from the rest of Europe. It's a little sad, right? It's weird because these are just land masses that existed thousands of years ago, but still, it makes you sad that the sun kind of set on their existence. And speaking of the sun setting, 
Now it's the summer, the sun is setting pretty late. Here where I live, it starts setting at 9 p.m. and then it rises from 6 a.m., which kind of makes it difficult if you want to sleep in or if you want to go to bed early. And the way that I have solved this is with the help of the sponsor of this video, Manta Sleep. Ever since they sponsored my previous video and sent over one of their sleep masks, I am addicted to using them. Other sleep masks just don't live up to the same quality. They're made with weird materials, light always gets in, it prevents you from sleeping on your side, but with Manta Sleep, all of these issues are solved. They use unique materials that allow airflow to come in, they provide 100% blackout, and they have a unique C-shaped design that allows you to sleep on your side, which is good because that's the way that I prefer to sleep. They also have an adjustable headband, which is really good if you have a strangely large head like I do. It's also super convenient because it comes with a mesh bag that you can put the mask in and then just wash it in the washing machine. So if you wanna fight those early sunrises and also the late sundown, make sure to try Manta Sleep today through the link in my description and you can also get free US shipping. And now let's get back to the video. Now let's dive a little deeper, literally, and go all the way across the world to take a look at Zealandia. And if it sounds like New Zealand to you, you're right because it's exactly where New Zealand is. Unlike Doggerland, which was more of a low land bridge, Zealandia is the real deal, an actual continental plate, 93% of which is today submerged beneath the Pacific Ocean. Zealandia was about 4.9 million square kilometers. That's about two thirds the size of Australia, roughly the same size as India. And yes, New Zealand is just the visible tip of this hidden continent. Think of it as the top of the iceberg of that geological world, with just a couple mountain tops peaking above the waves. You know, it's interesting because there's this mythological belief that the Portuguese islands of the Azores are actually the remaining mountains that existed in the supposed old continent of Atlantis. The story goes that the continent would have been submerged and the islands were all that was left. So it's interesting that in this case that is actually what happened, so maybe that's where they got the idea from. Zealandia used to be part of the supercontinent Gondwana, back when all southern land masses were stuck together. Around 85 million years ago, it started drifting away, eventually sinking, due to the thinning crust and tectonic movements. It was actually its own full-on continent, so much so that geologists today still push for it to be recognized as Earth's eighth continent, even if it is underwater. And in this case, what if it hadn't sunk? Imagine a continent-sized New Zealand, double the sheep, triple the breathtaking landscapes, and a whole lot more rugby. Australia would have a full-size neighbor competing for dominance in the South Pacific. The Maori people might have developed larger empires, and Polynesian navigation history could have taken a different turn entirely. Who knows, maybe Zealandia would have been the Pacific's cultural and economic powerhouse, especially because despite its size, Australia is mostly desert. Zealandia was likely not full of vast landscapes fit for living in. Now, our next example isn't too far away, so let's move a little bit to the west, to Southeast Asia. Have you ever noticed how close all of these islands are? Indonesia, Malaysia, Borneo, even the Philippines. It's no coincidence, during the Ice Age, sea levels were low enough to reveal a massive landmass called Sundaland. It connected the Asian mainland with present-day Indonesia and extended well into the Java Sea. Sundaland would have been around 1.8 million square kilometers, comparable to, I don't know, Mexico today. It was a lush, tropical environment, crisscross with a bunch of rivers, and with a lot of its own unique wildlife. And yes, humans live there too, possibly contributing to the early migrations into Australia. Similarly to Doggerland, rising sea levels eventually flooded it, breaking it into the thousands of islands that we see today. The flooding also isolated species, giving rise to some of the world's most unique biodiversity which is found in the area today, like the Komodo dragon or the orangutan. And what if it was still 
over the water. Southeast Asia might be dominated by a massive single nation, or at least a federation. Trade routes would be completely different because there wouldn't be the sea routes that we have today. Maybe it would favor land caravans. Java and Sumatra might be provinces instead of separate islands. And instead of island Southeast Asia, maybe we talk about the Sundaland block when we talked about geopolitics. Our next stop goes all the way north to the Bering Strait, or rather what used to be there. During the Ice Age, sea levels dropped so much that Alaska and Siberia were fully connected by a 1,600 kilometer wide landmass known as Beringia. It wasn't just a tiny bridge, it was a full on highway for humans, animals, probably a few confused mammoths that didn't know where they were going. Beringia was crucial to human history. It provided the route by which humans entered the Americas from Asia. Sometime between 20,000 and 15,000 years ago, it might have even hosted human settlements for thousands of years as people waited out glaciers that blocked further migration. Eventually, the rising sea levels did their thing again and put most of it underwater. They flooded the Bering Strait, cutting off the continents. The land disappeared underwater, leaving only memories encoded in ancient DNA that we sometimes find in animals today. If Beringia had stayed dry, North America could have experienced a steadier flow of migration from Asia. You might see more East Asian cultural influence in Native American traditions, or vice versa. Who knows, Russia and the US might be connected by more than Cold War nostalgia, Maybe we would have a railway from Moscow to Anchorage. I think this area still sometimes freezes over in the winter, technically connecting the two continents, but it's a very small remnant of the old landmass. And finally, let's head to the tropics, kind of. To the waters between Madagascar and India. It's where scientists recently uncovered evidence for Mauritia, a lost microcontinent that once lay under what is now the Indian Ocean. Mauritius wasn't huge, maybe the size of Iceland today, but it was interesting. It broke off from Madagascar about 60 to 85 million years ago, during the breakup of Gondwana, so it was hanging out with Zealandia for a while. For the longest time, it was considered just part of the ocean floor, but then scientists found ancient zircon crystals, which is just a fancy name for minerals, and dated them to be about 3 billion years old in volcanic rocks on Mauritius. That was a big deal because technically Mauritius is only 8 million years old, so something didn't add up. It turns out the islands were sitting on top of a much older continental crust, Mauritius the mini continent that I guess time had led us to forget. If the whole thing was still above sea level, the Indian Ocean would change drastically. There would be another player besides India in the region, plus Madagascar and the other island nations. So what do these lost continents tell us? Apart from being pretty good content for documentaries and fantasy novels, the continents remind us how alive our planet is. Sea levels rise and fall. What is dry today might be drowned tomorrow, and vice versa. It also teaches us how temporary our sense of permanence is. The world maps we learned in school, they're just snapshots in a geological photo album. So whenever you look at a map next time, when you look at the vast, vast oceans that we have, remember that maybe it's not just water, maybe underneath it is a remnant of a lost landmass. Sometimes people live there, ancient civilizations could have existed there. And it's just something interesting to think about. Thank you so much for watching this video. Thank you to my patrons for their direct support. If you want to join the Patreon and get your list here, no, here in the credits, make sure to do so. I will really appreciate the support. And either way, I will see you next time for more general knowledge.